Hello and welcome to a new episode of Highlights from the Hill, the HCAM show designed to bring you inside the Hopkinton Public School System. I'm your co-host Jim Cousins along with my co-host Dr. Carol Cavanaugh and here we talk about all things HPS. Today we're talking about drama which actually is so much more than drama. So hello Carol. Hi, Jim. Um, we are here with Valerie von Rosenvinga. Uh, she is the drama teacher at the high school, but as you say, so much more than, than just drama. Yes. Um, so I guess I will start, Valerie, by asking you about sort of your history with the Hopkinton Public Schools. When were you hired? What have you taught? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so um, this is my 18th year. Wow. I was hired the second year that the school, uh, the new school was open and was in charge of a full-blown acting curriculum. So we ta I taught acting, I taught acting two, I taught uh, technical theater and public speaking. And then I added courses like playwriting and play reading and directing and we did all of those things. And then little by little, all of those started to go away. And because my public speaking program really took off mm. and parents were more apt to suggest to their children that they should take public speaking than they should take acting, even though the skill set is pretty much the same. So I employ a lot of my acting um, kind of methodology into my public speaking. And then really what happened over the years was that um, I introduced a course called Passages, which is all preparing kids for life outside high school. And so my actual drama teaching during the day is not, doesn't exist anymore. Sure. But the after school program is pretty massive and I, use it as a, it's really a class, you know, how I teach it and I go over a lot of acting techniques and, you know, philosophy and things like that. So that's basically, yeah, 18 years, five to go. <laughs> <laughs> Who's counting? <laughs> I am. No. It's great. I love it. I love my job. Yeah. And so you're just coming <laughs> off of Pirates of Penzance. I am. We had 38 kids on, in the cast, 20 kids working on crew and production elements another 20 in the orchestra. It was awesome. It's, it's, I cannot tell you the sense of accomplishment because I'm just in the audience with everybody else. The kids literally do everything. I, I don't think in the 18 years I've been doing it, I've had to get up and go backstage more than twice. And once it was because a kid swore on stage and I was irritated. <laughs> So Radium Girls is very different from Pirates of Penzance. Yes, How is. do you choose a show? I look at current like things that are going on in the world. With Radium Girls, I was really drawn to it because of the whole like pollution elements, the uh, things that we have, you know, dump uh, toxic waste sites and and companies tendency to kind of not claim ownership and then later on we find out the children are sick because of it. And it's also actually was one of the most uh, frequently performed plays in high school um, over the past two years. And I wanted to do something that kind of forced the kids to take a look at the authority and realize that it's okay to question that they aren't, people in power aren't always telling you the truth. Mm. And um, so, you know, and I just come off doing Harvey, which was a comedy. And so I like to kind of mix it up a little bit. So that's kind of interesting because it's also not just a play, but it's also the message of the play that you find important. Oh, absolutely. Important. I, want, I want to do, Pirates was a, kind of an exception in that mm. regard because there's really no message to Pirates. <laughs> but I wanted them to experience Gilbert and Sullivan. So mm -hmm. that's the, the reason I went there. But I'm always looking to find something that has a teachable moment to it and that allows the kids to get inside the story and and feel a connection and a power in telling it and, and enlightening the audience with it. Mm -hmm. um, well, I just think it makes it a, a more, you know, enjoyable and meaningful experience for the kids. So you had about 60 kids mm -hmm. um, and Alex, who I know, uh, I worked in middle school, uh, must have been a pleasure in the oh my tech God, booth, I would fabulous. imagine. He loves the new board. Oh my God, he's very excited <laughs> about it. Yes. Yeah. I love him and he's a freshman, so it's like I have him for another three years. Yes. That's, that's lovely. So my question is, so you got about 60 kids, right? And it's not right. a class, it's kind of, it's a, it's a club. Right. Um, how do they find you? What draws them to this club? Well, you know, the first year I did this, I was literally pulling people out of the halls. 
because I was the new person mm -hmm. and there was kind of an allegiance to the person that had been there before and um, so that's how it all began. Now, one of the things I always do is at the beginning of the year I look for people that are new to the system and actually I got two people involved this year uh, because of that that are kind of looking lost and I see if there's anything like whether it's working on sets or sound, whether they like to paint to pull them in because my whole purpose is to create a community. Um, a community of players. So I've got the tech people and I've got the, the acting people. Mm -hmm. But anybody that wants to get involved in the fall production, I take. I find a place for them I don't, anywhere because it's like, especially if they're, they're new to the school or incoming freshmen, they, they immediately start off with, with people to say hi to in the halls, mm. right? So, and they have a place for four years. So I, I, I'm different than a coach. Even if somebody plays football all four years in high school, they're not with the same person. So I get to experience these children as they kind of blossom into, you know, being ready to go out into the world and mm -hmm. provide these opportunities for them to kind of test themselves, to try things, to, you know, we talk about the growth mindset and how failure is a part of it. And, and they, they don't mind failing. But they'll work at something and work at it and work at it until it feels right and mm. it feels authentic. So it's kind of word of mouth. I try and, you know, I let the eighth graders know in the spring previous what show I'm doing, that everybody's welcome. I have a meeting. And then people just kind of bring people in. But I also do this active recruiting of, of new people. And some kids look at me and say, uh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but um, like I said, two people this year who I think, you know, now feel like there's a, a home base for them that mm. might not have felt that way. Otherwise. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's awesome. And we have a closing circle <clears throat> after each show where the seniors get to say goodbye to the space. I make them all gifts, which is the cast has gotten bigger. It's been more, it used to be okay mm. when I had to make like 26 frames. This year I had to make 60. Um, so. But the seniors get to say goodbye to the space. And inevitably, they look at the freshmen and they say, this is going to go by so quickly. And there's a lot about high school that really sucks. But this, this is going to be your home. And you're going to feel safe here. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm always crying. Mm -hmm. They're crying. It's, um, it defines their high school experience. and. People have come back, and people are in touch with me still, even from that very first year I taught. Mm -hmm. They tell me when they have a baby, or you know, mm -hmm. I'm writing to them, or they hear about the production, and occasionally they'll come, mm -hmm. you know, and see it. And um, but they're really wonderful people. They're kind to each mm -hmm. other, mm -hmm. which is not something that you're always seeing, you know, because they have to be vulnerable, and they know I won't put up with any you know, ego stuff. I just won't because every single solitary person that's involved is a vibrant and, and necessary part of the whole. Hmm. And, you know, so I, I think it's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that's what I sort of, you know, so if you go and see one of your productions, yeah. what we're seeing on the stage are sort of the stars of your show, right. but there are so many people behind. Take us behind the scenes. Well, what does it look like when those kids are they're backstage? Sets they're back. Well, first of all, there's a whole world happening during the yeah. show itself, with costume changes, people putting on mics, people helping each. Other. Like we had some really quick costume changes, and you know, all of a sudden, crew people are over, you know, helping people with that and keeping just they're making sure everything's clean and nobody's missing their entrances, and you know, the stage manager is g getting ready to change the sets during the intermission. I mean, this was a, a, a show that didn't have a whole lot of set changes going on. But if you remember Radium Girls, it's like the curtain would close and I had, you know, nine or ten people on stage just moving everything as quickly and, and as quietly as we possibly could. I loved could. that show, by the way. It's a, loved it. It was wonderful, It was wasn't wonderful. It? Everything yeah. about it. I loved it. I know. It was great. Yeah. I agree. Um, yeah, and I think that the kids really liked it, too. They felt like they were telling an important story. But so, and from the very beginning of the school year, I'll sit down with the kids that are going to build my set, right, because I have to come up with a set idea. 
And because we were moving everything over to the middle school this year, because I wanted to have the room for the pit, because you, know, mm. you don't have room at the high school for, to put a pit, or, a pit orchestra in front of the stage, I had to make a set that was not gonna really mess with their schedule because they teach classes on the stage. Mm. So, but I was, so I sat down with a few kids. I said, all right, I need to make it look like a beach. And then we came up with the idea of paper mache. And then I noticed all these boxes being delivered to the high school for new desks. I said, oh, I'll take those, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so I'd have kids in there for like an hour and a half or two hours every, you know, like two or three days a week. They're just back there paper mache and they're talking and they're listening to music. And, you know, again, they're not on stage, but they're creating the world that the players are going to live in. Hmm. And so they have ownership over it. And I'm just, I just, I facilitate. I give them direction. I find movies, you know, okay, this is how you paint uh, a stone wall. I give it to one girl. I said, I'll be picking up the paint tomorrow. Formulate your team. You can have these, these four days. I'm not going to be on the stage. And, and she does it. Hmm. Do you know? So I don't, I think a lot of people don't recognize or they diminish the capabilities of kids in high school. Yeah. What I've discovered is if you assume that they can do things, they will rise to meet your assumption. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's when you don't do that. It's when you talk down to them or you assume that they're only capable of understanding or doing so much that they kind of, you know, they don't have respect for you because you don't have respect for them. Hmm. I love when you say they're creating the world that the players will live in. Yeah. That is such yeah. a nice way to put it. Well, they are. Yeah. yeah. So in the course of your 18-year career here in Hopkinton, yeah. there must be moments when you say your programming has changed the course of a kid's life. Yes, what's even better is when they say it. Yeah. yeah. You know, Matt Allum, who was just one of the... Yes. Okay. Yep. I had him, I had him a number of times, but my first, he was a freshman in my acting class the first year I was here. And then he took playwright, playwriting from me. Anyway, so he was waiting to see me when they were looking in the auditorium and I went out to him and um, Mr. Hanna was there so he can vouch for me. Matt said, I still remember the meditations because I've always done mindfulness mm. practices in my class. And I said, you're kidding me. He says, no, I still remember it. He goes, and I still quote Virginia Woolf because we read Who's Afraid of Virginia mm. Woolf. And I can still um, recite that Emily Dickinson poem you taught me. Yeah. And it was like, I was, I was blown away. I was like, really? Mm. He goes, absolutely. One of my favorite parts of being in the high school was, was being, he said, being in your world. He said, because everything else was so stressful and we would come in and it wasn't that we weren't learning things because we were, but it didn't seem like work. Mm. It was more play, Yeah, you know? And I was saying to Jim earlier, your, this whole thing about kids having their backpacks, you know, the yes. stuff that they carry with yes. them. I, you were preaching to the choir. I would, I had never framed it that way. But because of the way that I teach, I really try to get a form of one-to-one -one relationship with each of my students. Mm. It's harder now that my classes are bigger, but um, when you do that and you, you see them as, as the, hum the humanity of them, when you mm. sense the humanity of them, and you know, even though I'm 61 years old and they're 14, it's like, so? Right? At the essence, I remember being 14. You know, it's like I say to them, the spirit doesn't age. The, the hmm. Our physical self ages. Our, our spiritual awareness increases in our soul. We, we know things. We've experienced things. And we can, we're a little bit wiser. But they know tons of things that I don't know. And so if you can focus in on what they can give to you, they feel empowered. And oftentimes what they'll give to you is not only some information or, you know, something that, you know, I don't know, but they'll give you a window into who they are. Mm -hmm. And that when that trust is there, they are more apt to expose their vulnerabilities. They are more apt to take a risk. They are more apt to, you know, be okay with making a mistake. Um, and that's, that's growing you know you can't succeed if you're not afraid to fail I mean mm -hmm. you can't succeed if you're afraid to fail and um, 
you know, I'm not a big person for grades. I don't like grades because I don't think that anybody's worth can be determined by a, a number or a letter. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they're, they're parts of the, the, the job. So we find ways to do it that the kids think are, is fair yeah. and that I feel okay with. Um, but it's the best job ever. You know, kind of putting together all the stuff that you're talking about, yeah. would it be fair to describe what you do, teaching skills, running a play, as kind of like one layer of what you do, and then underneath that there's something completely different? Oh, absolutely. Talk about <laughs> that. I want... I want every child that I teach to feel empowered. I want them to have faith in their ability. I want them to um, have faith in their voice. I want them to understand that if they don't learn how to use their voice, somebody could very well speak on their behalf and they're going to find themselves in a situation that they don't want to be in. I think that I'm trying to tell them everything I wish somebody had told me. Um, I want them to know that they can't help but make a difference, but that only they are in charge of the difference that they're going to make. That, that, it, that that's a, it's a conscious, conscious thing. And I give them a lot of things that I, I'm hoping they're going to put in their back pocket and maybe 10 years from now go, oh, that's what she meant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually had a kid write me. He was, I think he was in his early 20s when I finally got the, when I got the email from him. But I used to tell, I tell kids little, like, you know, foundational truths. And one of them is when somebody calls you selfish, it's usually because you're not doing what they want you to do. And this kid writes me, he's like 23. I hadn't seen him since he graduated. I mean, it wasn't like I, I mean, I have Facebook friends, you yep. know, after they graduate. And he writes me, he says, I have to tell you something. I was in this relationship and the girl kept calling me selfish and all of a sudden I had this epiphany and I heard your voice telling me this and I realized that that's exactly what was going on. So I broke up with her. I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> you know? And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. So that's what I hope. I hope, you know, I mean, this is my major contribution, so it's like at the end of every life, you should be able to sit there and say, I've made the, has the world been made a better place for having me in it? Mm -hmm. And because of this job, I, am, I think I'd be able to say yes. Yeah. And I do so. think you're in a good place because, you know, so you ask kids to sit and paint walls, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, that's not a skill that we care that they leave with, right? right? It's all of the other interactions that they have with each other because right. they are human beings. Right. That and they work so together. And it's like you do space. this and you do this and I'll do this. Yes. And it's, it's entirely collaborative. And so there are a lot of things, you know, that in academics that aren't collaborative. Um, right. I mean, they try to infuse it, but sometimes it's not, you know. Yes. And so this is, there's nothing about it that's not collaborative. You can't go in there and do it all on your own. Right. There's not I'm one element of it. I'm going to take a math test all by myself. Right. Mm -hmm. But in your world, everyone is part of that production at once. Absolutely. Every single player, whether you're wearing the back te black t-shirt behind the Absolutely. scenes or right. you're out there. Right. You know, so singing. I before you know before each show we we and before most rehearsals I have them all stand in a circle, holding hands, and I say take a look around at the face every face mm. in the circle. Because, and at the beginning of the process, a lot of them don't, especially the freshmen, that they don't know, and like, oh my God. <laughs> um, I said, every face. You look at every face. Mm. Because you're, each one of these people has your back. You know, and so from the very beginning, I'm kind of, even if they don't really feel the truth of that until the actual production mm -hmm. is up on its feet and running and you yeah. see the, in, you know, the integration of all the different parts, it's from the very beginning, I'm saying nobody in here is above the other. You are all, you know, and look at everybody. So, yeah. um, and when yeah. a production ends, they must have sort of this big oh hole my in God, their it's lives. Really bad. Like, how do they? Yes, exactly. I'm so happy when it's over. They <laughs> don't know what to do with themselves. They don't know what to do uh -huh. with themselves. And they're like, because from the very beginning of school, they've had a place to go every day after right. school. And now all right. of a sudden, it's like, you know, now what do we Emptiness. do? Mm. Um, but they have more people to say hi to in the halls and, you know, yeah. 
and people to sit with come. at the lunch. You know, yeah. Mm. And then, well, then they're like, you know, so what are you doing next year? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> and then the winter so plays very different because I can't, I can't yeah. do, you know, with these kind of plays with a cast of 38. There just aren't that many mm. plays out mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So it's a smaller, more intimate group. Um, but, you know, anybody, like last year, one of my leads was a freshman. Like, I don't mm -hmm. do that thing, like, if you're a senior, you get prior. Sure. Like, no, okay. whoever fits the part gets the part, right. you know. So, so um, can I ask a question? You can ask me anything you want. Have you ever written a play? I've written a number of them. Yes, I have. And they've been done. Yeah? yeah. Tell, tell us about a couple. Um, probably the one that was done most extensively it had a production in um, Sioux City, Iowa. It had a production in Virginia, and it had a production in Boston. And uh, it started in Wellesley, and then it had it was a fest went to a festival piece in Boston. It's called The Quarterly, and it's about eight women, four from the late 1800s and four from the late 1900s, and how they're 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 basically it's a great great grandmother and a granddaughter you know they, they okay. live in the same house mm -hmm. and so the spirits kind of interact and go back and forth and it was basically my way of working through some issues that mm. I had in my own life but I'm <laughs> now I also write books I'm currently just I finished my, the first volume of a trilogy um, that's speculative fiction and it's currently being edited and I'm been going to Italy in the summers to write it and so now I'm going to Scotland because my main character is about to take off in the Outer Hebrides so nice. it's just I create the world I want to live in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fun. Now well, do your I, kids know this? The secret life? Of um, some of them do, yeah. not many of them. Yeah. One, like, I had some of the students that I took on the trip, oh, took a Charlotte and I took one of the trips sure. to the leadership conference right. and so I was talking about it to some of them, and three of them asked me to send it to them, and I did, but one of them actually read it. Wrote me, like, feedback, because, you know, what was she felt was meaningful, there's stuff in there about climate change, and she said, I think you should talk more about this, because that's really important to our generation, and mm. she took it very seriously, and yeah. I took her comments very seriously, mm. so. Yeah, but I don't really brag about, like, me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, really, because when you're in the it, classroom, it, it's about it, them. It's right. Mm. It's like I look at the students, I say, I work for you. Yeah. I go, I don't work for your parents. They may yeah. pay the taxes. I said, but at the end of the day, it's about what you walk out of this room with. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So let's find a way for you to walk out of the room with the stuff you need to know. Mm. Yeah. What's the favorite part of um, the class that you teach? Uh, my favorite thing? Mm -hmm. is when I have a student who tells me at the beginning of public speaking, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. And by the end of the class, they're up there, and they're not shaking, and they're not sweating, and they're, they may not be the best public speaker, but they're not afraid anymore. Mm -hmm. And what that does is so much more than public speaking. It, it says to them, the things that I think I know about myself may not be mm -hmm. the truth about myself. Mm -hmm. And that if I really work at something and I really believe I can get to the other side of a fear or a feeling of, you know, um, despair or whatever, mm -hmm. I can do it. And so that's, that to me is like the essence of a good education is that a kid says, I can do it. Yeah. Especially that kind of skill. That kind of skill is useful every day. I know. I tell that's them. Right. Yeah. It should really be required. I'm just putting it that out there. Not that I want <laughs> to teach the entire school. <laughs> But because there are kids in college who go off after taking my class and come back and say, Valerie, th these kids don't know what they're thinking. I agree I'm with you. I'm so glad I took this class. I think speaking <laughs> and written expression are the two things that if we could give them to kids. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Calculus. Mm -hmm. I, I know. Well, I don't use it that often. <laughs> yeah, I don't use Although it that Although I do, often geometry either. I do in building sets. I'm sure. So I will say geometry yeah. is, has actually yeah. come into play. Yeah. 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 So other, I, we're, we're running short on time, so mm -hmm. I'm just like really interested in the, the mechanics of how the club works to create this play. Are there any other, like... Well, Clorinda Kerr, she helps me with costumes. She's okay. absolutely brilliant. And, and the fact that she's still doing it after her children have left the system mm. is, is like, oh my God. Yes. I keep telling her, when you leave, I'm done with this part. <laughs> um, but... 
I basically do everything. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a benefit to that, and it just means I know I know all the wheels that are in place. Sure. But I have the kids. I trust the kids implicitly. So I will say, all right, you know, you're going to do this. I, I never tell them when I'm blocking a scene. I say, okay, mm. just, all right, there are three of you on stage. Just do it. Mm. Let's watch it. And they just look at me like, you're not going to tell us where to... I said, did people tell you where to move in your real life? No, I want you to just move. I'll tell you if it looks good, and I'll tell you if it doesn't work. And so they, they over the process of the rehearsal period, begin to become the other, which is one of the best things you can do to establish a sense of empathy. So, for example, Matt, Matt Dempsey, who played you know the bad guy, kind mm -hmm. of, right, in, in Radium Girls initially mm. didn't want to because he was the bad guy. I said, yeah, but you, you don't, he doesn't know that he's bad. Mm. He does, he truly is not making, getting up every morning and say, I'm going to do this bad thing. Right. So it gives them a little bit better sense yes. of um, appreciating decisions that other people make that may not turn out yes. the best. So do you okay. have a favorite show? A favorite show of all times? Oh my gosh. Um, I know it's a terrible question because as a former English the ones, teacher, people the say, what's that, your best book? Right. Aww. The ones that, um, th that I've directed? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a Piece of My Heart. Hmm. It was the Vietnam Nurses. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's it was lovely. a really powerful, beautiful piece. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay. And that is the end. You are a deeply fascinating person. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I really yeah. enjoy this. That's good. My I kids just go, Mom. <laughs> I tell her all the time she's groovy. <laughs> yeah, groovy. Yeah. That's a fact. So I, I had guess. to slip that in. All right. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Yes, right. thank you so much. Of course. And it was lovely. Thank you for joining us for this episode. And we hope you tune in next time. We'll be talking about something else. Have a great day. From the outside, it looked like I had it all together. Great education, good job, but inside I was massively insecure. Drinking helped me calm my fears, but I ended up losing everything. When I finally admitted I needed help, I came into Teen Challenge, and as time went on, I didn't feel so insecure. Now my whole world has been rebuilt, and I'm not going to lose it again.